I had to turn my mic off because I sing my heart out up here and you don't want to hear me sing, but <laughs> um, thanks worship team, thanks tech team. Sorry we couldn't be outside today, we were watching this storm theoretically come across, you're always calling the shots and there's a big uh, blotch on the radar so we thought we wouldn't risk it, but of course if we do that it won't rain. <laughs> Um, but it's good to see all of you, those of you who are visiting this weekend, welcome. Thorsons, glad to have you guys back from your trip, glad to see all of you. Um, I want to show you something this morning, I got something new in the mail this week, and it is my first U.S. passport, look at that right there. I am officially an American, I even have a smirk on my face there, so <laughs> not sure what that means, but uh, you get what you get. <laughs> Um, but, you know, uh, this is um, a weekend where we celebrate our freedom. And uh, it's actually interesting because I have dual citizenship. I'm Canadian and American now. So uh, it's a big holiday weekend because Friday was Canada Day. And then tomorrow is uh, Independence Day. And so I, when I was a kid growing up, we, I lived near Detroit, Michigan, on the Canadian side. So there used to be these great... Uh, they called it the International Freedom Festival, and there were these gr great fireworks, and our youth group would go down to the river, and we would just have this great thing um, where we would celebrate our two countries and celebrate the common freedom that we have together, and it was really good. Now, I know uh, Waconia is way better now that I live in Waconia, but, uh, <laughs> um, but here's what I uh, want us to see as we come to this text of Scripture um, freedom is not something to be taken lightly. And we need to understand that there is in freedom a vulnerability. Freedom can actually become an idolatry. And when freedom becomes an idolatry, um, it ends up doing all kinds of damage to the unity and the community and the uh, organism by which we have our freedom. And um, uh, Thomas Jefferson had the famous statement, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Now we live in a culture where there is um, what I want to call radical autonomy. And by radical autonomy, that means that freedom has become the ultimate. And once freedom becomes my personal ultimate reality, you don't matter. The unit doesn't matter. Other people don't matter. I matter. And we can see in our culture, whether it is um, the womb, whether it's our sexual identity, whether it's economics and politics, um, when radical autonomy takes over, it's my will, my agenda, my ideas against all of yours, and that becomes detrimental to the whole cause. But here's Here's what I want to say this morning in terms of the church. You're not about to get, some of you are visiting, you're not about to get a political sermon. But let me tell you this, that the greatest threat to America, the greatest threat to the world, is not the radical autonomy of the culture or the society. It's the subtle autonomy of Christians. I'm going to explain that. And let, it's the subtle autonomy. It's not that the world is out there going, we were going to live our own way. That's been happening since the Garden of Eden. Truth. In the Garden of Eden, it was Satan who whispered into the ear of the first couple and said to them, you can be God. You can know, you can know good and evil. And I believe what Satan was saying to Adam and Eve, our, our first father and mother, what he was saying to them was that you can decide what is good. You can decide what is evil. And in a world where everyone decides for themselves what is good and evil, there's chaos. But in the gospel, we have been given a Lord. And that Lord is the one who guides and defines and redeems and rescues. And for us, where we get our marching orders, where we get our identity, where we get our reality is from the Lord Jesus Christ, who has triumphed over sin and death. It's we have just been singing. And so what you and I are meant to see is that deep in our hearts as Christians, we're meant to read passages like this. This passage is declaring that Satan is defeated. It's announcing the kingdom has come, that Christ has triumphed. As it announces that, Theophilus, whom Luke is writing to, 
and the, the, the crowds that are watching Jesus interact with the people who are accusing and criticizing him, what they are meant to see in the scenario, what we're meant to see is that all of us need to be on, on guard against those subtle places in our lives where we refuse the lordship of Jesus Christ. And we all have them, right? I mean, yes, the world says, yes, we don't want God. We want to be God. But there are parts of your life and there are parts of my life where I put up a little barrier and I say, not there, Jesus. I don't want you getting in there and invading that part of my life. We have these little uh, guards, these little pylons, spiritual pylons that we've set out here and we've said to Jesus, Jesus, don't come any further. And I'll tell you this, that's exactly where we want Jesus to come. And I'm going to ask you today to ask that difficult question because you will not have freedom until Jesus is Lord over your life. You will not have freedom until you invite Jesus and his grace and the good news of his gospel into those areas where you're resistant to him coming in there. There's no freedom apart from that. Listen, I'll, uh, listen to this Tim Keller quote. This might help you. Keller says, to experience the joy and freedom of love you have to give up your personal autonomy. Freedom then is not the absence of limitations and constraints, but it's finding the right ones, those that fit our nature and liberate us. From his book, um, The Reason for God. And so you and I need to invite Jesus Christ in, and that's what I'm asking you to do. Right now, would you pause and say, this is that area of my life where I've said to Jesus, let's not go there. Let's not talk about that area. Um, let me just add this as an aside. If you have some of those areas, that might be the very place where God wants, you to show, wants to show you the grace and the triumphant power of the gospel. If you've gone cold, if you've gone dull, if you've gone distant from the Lord and you've kind of just had, had God at arm's length and you've thought, man, the good old days of my spiritual life, the fresh days. I heard people singing with passion today, but that's not where I am. Can I ask you the question, would you say to God, come on in. Would you say to Christ, be Lord of that area of my life? I believe that if you do that by faith, you will experience a fresh wave of the goodness and the grace of our delivering Savior in your life. And so that's what I want you to do today. So as we walk through this text, we could easily look at this text and say, oh yeah, those religious people, look how hypocritical. That's not what we're meant to do. We're to look at that and say, I've got a Pharisee in me. I've got, I've got a guard in me that wants to point out there rather than to look deep within. And I want to invite God to come, and I want to surrender to King Jesus. Do you want to sur surrender to Jesus and his mission today? Yeah. I mean, really surrender. Wouldn't it be great? You could remember, this would be an easy weekend for the rest of your life to remember you gave up your independence in order to find freedom in Jesus Christ. I invite you to do that today. So as I'm talking, and I want you to worship over the word of God, worship the Savior. There's two things I'm going to do in this text of scripture this morning. One is I want to hold up the great news Jesus has overcome. I want to hold up that great news. I want you to see that. And then I want to show you the great need. If that's true, then there is a great need when, when we're living out our lives on mission. Christ is calling us Jesus is calling us to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. And we need Jesus to come and help us do that in our lives. So let's look at this together. So let's start out with the great news. And here's the great news. The great news is God's kingdom has come. Satan's tyranny is over. I want you to believe that today. And I'm going to show it to you in the text. This is Jesus in Luke's gospel Luke says that Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem. And so Jesus is on the way to the cross. And on the way to the cross, he has an agenda. His agenda is to end the tyranny of the enemy who has tormented and lied and deceived humanity since the Garden of Eden. He is on his way to restore all things unto himself. So look at this verse of scripture with me. Luke chapter 11 and verse 14. 
It says, now he was, casting, he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke and the people marveled. I just want you to, I want you to start out just thinking about this scene. Jesus, immediately after the disciples say, teach us, Lord, to pray. Immediately after that, he does this miracle. And you and I need to understand, this is not just kind of Luke writing stories um, casually and disconnected. What had they just been taught to pray in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your, say it with me, kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Bring your kingdom, God, in a world under tyranny. And uh, just think of how many people in the world live without freedom. They know what tyrannical leadership is like. And in those places, oh, for freedom, oh, for deliverance. My dear friends, that's the story of humanity since the Garden of Eden. We have lived under the tyranny of sin and Satan and death. And Jesus says, talk to your father and say, enough is enough. Are you praying this at all in your life? Rescue me from the tyranny of sin and Satan and the curse and death. Thy kingdom come. This is what happens. His kingdom comes. And Jesus comes along and there's a man who is mute because of demonic depression. And he casts out the mute demon and immediately the man speaks. That's a picture of the gospel. You need to see that. Satan has muted our lips. He has alienated us from God so that we're worshipers of ourselves rather than the worshipers of, of, uh, worshipers of the true God, the true Lord. We are alienated from one another, Adam and Eve, divided at sin. This is the woman you gave me. And, and we can't truly speak to one another. We don't communicate. We're in a tower, tower of Babel world. Have you ever experienced that? Why don't you understand me? We have in our hearts divisions and desires that push us apart from one another. Jesus comes along and drives Satan out of this man. And when he delivers this man from Satan, he opens his mouth to sing the praises of his God. That's our conversion. Amen. I hope you've been singing today, not because externally there's music to sing, but internally there's a song that can't be silenced. I can't stop singing. He has rescued me. You know, I, I could sing all day standing up here. I don't care if you're, yeah, I do care you're here, but I, I get lost in wonder and praise, right? Lord Jesus, you, you chose me from before the foundation of the world. You delivered me at the cost of, of your own blood on Calvary's cross. That's what he does. He opens up our lips, and then we can't be silent. I'm sitting here thinking, let me preach. Let me tell people that Satan no longer has dominion. Christ is on the throne. He's been defeated. His power has been destroyed. Oh yeah, he's making a lot of noise and he's doing a lot of vandalism, but he is done. Amen. He is defeated. Amen. Isn't that good news? Yes. I want to show you. Take your Bible and go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 is a beautiful depiction under the power of the Holy Spirit where John describes the reality, the beauty, the glory in which we now live because of the gospel. The word revelation means, you know, the apocalypse. We translate it um, revelation because it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. We think apocalypse means a catastrophe. John, when he says the apocalypse, the revelation of Jesus Christ means glory. That this is the revelation, the glory of Jesus, the lamb who was slain, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who has been slain in order that he might, by the lamb, redeem all the nations. Handles Messiah is in Revelation chapter 11, and he will reign forever and ever. Amen. And in chapter 12, we have this description of Satan being defeated. Listen, listen to this and rejoice and a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains in the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great red dragon 
with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. And his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child. And listen to this description. One who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Just think about that. That is the summary of the gospel. Right there. A woman had a child. An enemy wanted to destroy that child. But that child was safely delivered and has now been taken up to the throne room. My dear friends, that child is Jesus Christ. That woman is not just Mary of Mary and Joseph. That woman is the church. It's all of the people of God in the Old Testament who have been anticipating this birthing moment where the Messiah would come and the church now who exists because of that birth. It's all of the people of God here and that serpent who wanted him. Well, we'll see. Look at this text, who that serpent is. It says in the woman, verse 6, fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. Who is the great great dragon? That ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and power and the kingdom of God and the authority of Christ has come for the accusers, uh, accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who has accused them day and night before our God. Isn't that great? So here's the scene. Satan has been thrown down. Christ has been raised up. That's the story. The one who used to deceive us and then accuse us before God no longer stands in the presence of God. There is someone else standing in the presence. It's Jesus Christ who intercedes for us and who will bring any charge against God's elect. He's the one who justifies. That's the good news. That's your reality, church. That's your reality. Now listen. Listen. As he describes it, it says here in verse 10, And I heard a loud voice saying, Now the salvation and power in the kingdom of our God and the authority of Christ has come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them by day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony. It is the finished work of Christ on the cross that has defeated Satan. It is the word of the testimony. It is the power of the message of the gospel. He has no authority. He has no power. For they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is sure. Oh, he's, t- he's, he's lost his authority, he's lost his power, but he's pretty ticked off, right? So the good news in this Luke passage is the kingdom has come. The kingdom has come. Verse 13, and when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman and the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed the river and that the dragon had poured out, uh, that the dragon had poured out from his mouth then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus and he stood on the sand of the sea Now, my dear friends, Satan has been defeated Christ has won the victory he has ascended on high the enemy's ticked off but he has been depowered 
in his ability. The kingdom has come. That's what we're seeing, the answer to the prayer in Luke chapter 11 as we prayed that prayer and Jesus casts out the enemy as he's making his way towards Jerusalem. We ought to rejoice in this. Notice in, go back to Luke 11, just notice this one little phrase I want you to see here as Jesus is talking about the description of this scene. Down in verse 20, Jesus says, but if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. That phrase, if by the finger of God I cast out demons, echoes back to the Old Testament when God delivered the people of Israel from Pharaoh in Egypt. In the book of Exodus chapter 8, I think it's verse 19, in that chapter, God is sending the the plagues upon Egypt, and in the plagues, he sends gnats, and then he sends flies. In the middle of it, Pharaoh's uh, spokesmen, wisdom, uh, wise men, say to him, this is the finger of God. And Jesus says, this is the finger of God. Just as God delivered the people of Israel from captivity in Egypt, now God in Jesus Christ has taken the finger and pushed Satan out. And he has, it only takes the finger of God. Satan and God are not equal. One little word will fell him, Martin Luther says. The power belongs to him. Is that not good news? Friends, feel the good news. This is the announcement that we see here, thy kingdom come. Now here is the great need, vigilance. That revelation passage is meant to tell us that we need to be vigilant because the enemy wants to keep us powerless. The enemy wants to get us off track. He wants to do as much damage. So in Revelation 12, 17, it says the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold the te- to the testimony of Jesus. Friends, that is you and me. That is the church. That's the one. Satan has his tools. He is a deceiver coming along to tempt us into unbelief. He is an accuser who comes along and tells us there's no hope. He is a gospel denier. That's why we need to sing it. To sing the gospel over and over again. That's why we need to repeat it. We need to hear Satan is not equal. Satan is defeated. Sin cannot triumph because tri- sin has been defeated at the cross of Jesus Christ. But he will come along and he'll whisper words into our hearts. And when we read this text, you see the demonic lie in this passage where Jesus casts out a demon and immediately gets pushed back. And again, as Thomas Jefferson says, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. We have to be vigilant. And so I just want to point out to you in this passage of Scripture, what are the things that Satan does? How does he get in to tempt us that we need to see in this passage and not to to invite Jesus into the corners of our lives? I'm going to ask you to ask yourself the question this morning, are any of these things in the text in you? There are three things that I want to show you in this text where we can be deceived and not be responsive to the Lord and open to his mission. The first is what I'm going to call skepticism or cynicism. Let me just be honest. We all fight this. We fight this. And you and I need to hear and realize that we fight this because one of the reasons we're not on mission for God, because Christ is calling on missions, one of the missions is we have this argument in our head, oh, they're a bunch of hypocrites, oh yeah, we'll see. We're going to have a baptism next week? Oh yeah, we'll see. Right? The plague of that skepticism, my dear friends, skepticism is of the devil. God has triumphed in Jesus Christ and he will build the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against him. That's what we need to hear. Skepticism is one of them. Pacifism is another. Sitting on the sidelines, wait and watch. And then I needed to throw a a good Scrabble word in, so I threw in recidivism. And uh, you'll see why in a minute. But recidivism essentially is what happens when you're a criminal and you return to your crime, when you're an addict and you return to your addictions. And that's one of the other ways that Satan deceives us. So let's, let's look at these passages. Here's the first thing. And, and just, again, let me be real personal. 
God help me, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? God help me understand. My heart is cynicism keeping you off mission from God. Is that a, are the voices and the lies of the enemy. So look at verse 15 and 16. Jesus casts out a demon, and immediately we have two things, two responses. Some of them said he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demon, while others, to test him, keep seeking him from a si- keep seeking for a sign from heaven. You see those two different responses? Both birthed out of cynicism or skepticism. The first person, you know, the cynical, says, oh, he's casting them out by Beelzebul. And I'm sure these people had heard that because of Jesus' miracles, people were calling him Lord. And they said, oh, yeah, he belongs to some Lord, not our Lord. He belongs to the Lord of darkness. Beelzebul was an um, Old Testament from 1 Kings. God... And that God was actually the Lord of the flies, what he was called. But as time went on in Jewish writing and scholarship, Beelzebub became, sorry, Beelzebul. And Beelzebul was the prince of all the demons. And so this man speaks, these people start speaking to Jesus. This is demonic. This is evil. And you'd think, can you imagine... (laughs) What's going on here? He's delivering and rescuing people. But inside, they were so in, in, uh, infected by Satan's lies and deceit that they can't see it as a legitimate work of God. And so some of us, that's what we wrestle with. We wrestle with the cry for more, for or the cry of doubt and the, the, the cry of cynicism. I, you know, one of, the, one of the people I saw, saw this when I was reading was Dawkins. Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins tried to give the logical, rational argument of an atheist. But as you read Dawkins, and this was a lot of the criticism even by people who weren't Christian of him, it was realized he was too impassioned. Right? This wasn't just logical, reasonable response. There was in his heart a hatred for God and his kingdom. Listen to Dawkins in his his book, The God Delusion. He writes, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynist, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capricious, malevolent bully. And I say with Shakespeare, methinks thou dost protest too much. And and that's what I'm going to ask you. If you're a cynic here today, let me ask you the reason why. Is it because there's no rational proof? Is this because Jesus really is evil? Is it because it's all corrupt? Or have you just been so tainted by sin in the world that you can't see light? And I don't mean that arrogantly, because that's what Satan does. Dawkins uh, displays that he's got a a radical um, agenda on his own heart. He wants to be his own God. Listen to what he says. He says, there is something infantile in the presumption that someone else has to be responsible to give your life and meaning. The true adult view, by contrast, is that our life is meaningful, as full and wonderful as we choose to make it. You can be God, knowing good and evil. My friends, that's, that's what's in the culture, but honestly, that's what's in us sometimes. I wanna, I'm going to do it my way. We're cynical. Or we, 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 we say, I need more evidence. Are you sitting there waiting for more evidence for God? Is it because there's a lack of evidence? Listen to um, J.C. Ryle. He says, it's always one mark of a thoroughly unbelieving heart to pretend to want more evidence of the truth of religion. You know, it's really interesting to watch Jesus respond to this pushback after he's delivered a man, after the man has spoken, after he's set free, the cynicism and the, and the, and the desire, the skepticism comes in. Jesus responds, and notice what he says in verse 
um, 17, but he knowing their thoughts. He's not even in on their words. He knows their thoughts. That's a declaration of his identity. That's a miracle as much as healing the man before. But he knowing their thoughts said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and a divided household falls. And if Satan is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. Just stop it. It's, I don't know if Jesus is doing tongue-in-cheek and sarcasm. He's going, what's your problem? If, if it's by Beelzebul, a kingdom divided against its start won't, uh, itself won't stand. <laughs> so so why, why don't you let me go at it? If the, if the enemies are fighting and turned against one another, let them go. But then he says to them something further. He says in this verse, And if I cast out demons, verse 19, by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? So not only is it the absurdity of saying this is Satan casting out Satan, but he says there's accountability here. Notice the next line. He says there's hypocrisy. He says if, if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? They will be your judges. They will be your judges. In other words, you're actually criticizing your own people, some of the Jewish people, obviously, could cast out demons. Said, you, ca- you say, I'm doing it by Beelzebub, then what are you going to say to them? They're going to judge you. They're going to rise up and say, no, this is God. But notice then the next line that Jesus says, which is the crucial line. But he says, it, if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. This is the finger of God casting out demons. Now let me just stop and say this. Because we could look at them and go, what, what's wrong with them? But I need to look in my heart and say, am I looking for the finger of God? Believing when God works, tuned into it. And if not, God, I need you to come in and remove that doubt and unbelief out of my heart, that cynicism and skepticism. Because that's the area where I do not have freedom. And that's the area where I'm keeping God out. And I'm going to ask you the question, is this where you're struggling? Are you sitting on the sidelines in the back row scoffing as God is working in people's lives? Why? That makes you accountable. God, Christ is not being judged here. They are. And again, I, I'm not, I don't even want to sound harsh today. I just want to ask you the question, would you be honest with yourself? Between you and God. Just be honest with yourself. Here's the second thing. Not only is it skepticism that's a problem here, but there is pacifism. Uh, and, and basically what Jesus is teaching here, I just want to be really clear, there is no Switzerland in the kingdom of God. Amen. There is no Switzerland. There is no neutrality in the kingdom of God. Listen to what Jesus says in this text of scripture in verse 21. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger Then he attacks him and overcomes him. He takes away his armor in which he trusts and divides his spoil. Jesus is saying here, what you just saw is not equality. Satan is strong. I am stronger. Mm. He is greater. Satan is a creature. This is the eternal son of God who has come in power. And he says, when I come, I am not leaving Satan any territory. I will take what is his and make it mine. But notice the next line, which is crucial. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. In another place, Jesus says, if they're not against me, they're for me. But here he says, if you're not for me, you're against me. If you're not gathering, you're scattering. There is nobody who belongs to me that can be off mission. He says, it's not consistent with who I am and what I am doing. Listen to Reichen, Philip Reichen. He says, there is no re- neutrality. Either we're for Christ and his kingdom or we are against him. If we are for him, then we'll join him in his great work of gathering souls to God. But if we're against him, then we'll only drive people away, scattering them to Satan. Choose this day whom you will serve. 
Now, I want you to think about this. What's Jesus saying here? You know, there are a lot of states, including Minnesota, that have what's called a Good Samaritan law. And a Good Samaritan law is a general law saying, if you encounter someone who is being violated or someone who is being injured, somebody somebody's in trouble, and you have unreasonable ability to help them, and you don't help them, you are guilty. And Jesus says, Satan has tyrannized this world enough. He has crushed people and guilted people and shamed people and violated people. And if you come across someone who is shamed and violated and you do nothing, you don't belong to the kingdom of God. You don't have the heart of Christ. See what he's saying there? He's calling us to have the heart and the mind of Christ. And I just, I just want to ask the question, have some of you been sitting in neutral? Have you been sitting here and saying, you know, I'm just going to watch this go by. I'm just going to wait up. My friend's not in his kingdom. There is no neutral. There's no Switzerland. Not while the world is perishing. Christ has come. I'm taking Satan down. Come with me. Isn't that good news? The good news that starts this is Satan's defeated. Amen. The great news is He's gonna, Jesus is going to take the world down to the ends of the earth. Sitting on the sidelines and watching it go by is not Christian. It's not godly. It's not of Christ. And so some of you have your own wounds and your own stories that have put you on the sidelines. But I'm asking you today, in the grace of the risen, reigning Christ, let's join. Let's go. Let's not be neutral anymore. Not while people are perishing. Does that make sense? Amen. May the Lord help us. The third thing is my special word of the day, recidivism. And uh, that's the tendency to return to our own way, old ways, to our own struggles, our own addictions. Look at the end of this passage. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest. And finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. So just lest you think if you defeat Satan, that he's just going to go on a holiday in the desert. That's not Satan. He's tenacious. That's not the servants of Satan. They want to, they only find rest in destroying, deceiving, and lying. So he says here, he says, I'll return to the house. And when he comes and finds the house swept and put in order, then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So who is this person? This is the person that needs Jesus for a little while, but not for the long while. This is the person that says, you know, I, my life's difficult, my marriage is falling apart, I've got an addiction, I'm battling depression, all legitimate things. I'm not trying to belittle any of those things. All legitimate struggles. But once it gets back to normal, they go back to normal. That's a dangerous place. It's exactly where Satan... Because if you don't fill yourself with something other than the world, the world and the devil will seep right back in stronger than ever before. Let's say your struggle is with pornography and you get over that battle. Satan will be back with greed, pride, right? Self-righteousness, religiosity. He'll come with a bucket load of things that you can walk around and tell your story that you're the hero that's overcome all those things and he'll lock you down worse away from your need of Jesus than ever. Listen to... Again, what uh, J.C. Ryle says, there is no safety except in thorough Christianity. The house must not only be swept, a new tenant must be in introduced. Yeah. The outward life must not be decorated with the formal trappings of religion. The power of religion must be experienced in the inner man. The devil must not only be cast out, the Holy Spirit must take his place. Christ must dwell in our hearts by faith. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, Jesus is not, you, want, you know those TV shows, Fixer Upper? People fix up things and move on. Jesus is not a fixer upper. He's a mover inner. He comes in and he seals and he's, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's the promise here. We need 
the Holy Spirit to indwell us. We need Christ in us. Listen to Philip Ryken. Moral reformation without spiritual re regeneration will lead to demonic de domination. If Christ isn't in you, the devil will be back. And so that's really the, the call here. You know, you know, it's interesting in Matthew's gospel when this verse is quoted and where, where in this gospel Jesus says, if it's by the finger of God that I do this, the kingdom of God is here, Luke actually says, if it's by the spirit of God that this happens, the kingdom of God has gone near to you. What, what is it, what's being said here? The finger of God is the spirit of God. You will never drive sin out and Satan out without the help of the Holy Spirit. That's the role of the Holy Spirit, to seal you, to sanctify you, to transform you, to never let you be triple, quadruple tackled by the demonic world and all its accusations and lies. No more. They are no match for Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what is needed. Here's, here's the good news, folks. The good news is Jesus has already won the battle. Jesus has won the victory, and Jesus will not stop till every tribe, every tongue, every people are weeping and rejoicing at his throne. Amen. That is great, glorious news. So you and I need to say, God, come. Please come. It's been enough. If you're the cynic and skeptic, would you confess that today? Today, that's me. Before you leave, just say, that's what's kept me from being on mission, for leaving and following Christ. Just confess it. He, that's a, just so you know, that's a forgivable sin. And most of us have suffered, and most of us will be tempted by that. Confess that. If, you, if, you're, if you've been Switzerland sitting on the sidelines waiting for this whole thing to unfold, no more. Just say, I'm committing. But, but, but say, I'm committing because you're committed. I'm I'm following. Take up the cause of Christ today. Wouldn't you take up the cause, today, cause of Christ if you say to me, well, I don't even know how to begin with that, I'll tell you a really simple answer. Pray. Just start play, praying to see people come to Christ. Just start praying that people would bow the knee to Jesus. Just start praying. If you want to get engaged and really have your heart changed, pray. Get it between you and God. He loves to answer those prayers and work in you. Just pray. Yes. Switzerland doesn't pray. But those who pray will never stay Switzerland. Sorry. And those of you who are from Switzerland... Uh, it's a great country, and I hope to go there someday. <laughs> I wasn't thinking I was going to beat up on Switzerland when I was preaching, but I thought you said that too many times today. <laughs> and here's the third thing. If God does a work, keep going. Continue. Keep asking the Holy Spirit to work in and through you, because this is worth it. Nothing else is worth it, but Jesus and his kingdom is worth it all. Do you agree? Let's pray together. Oh, Jesus, thank you that you defeated the enemy through, the, through your blood, the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And we announce that there is no longer a tyrant that's ruling over the world, but there is a great high priest making intercession because of his blood on our behalf. I pray, Heavenly Father, would you heal our skepticism I pray, Heavenly Father, would you take away a passive heart. Make us passionate about Christ and the gospel. I pray, Heavenly Father, that when Jesus does a work in my life, that I will say, do it again, do it again, do it again. Jesus, be in everything. Jesus, be over everything. Jesus, be all in all. That's our prayer. On this 4th of July weekend, we want real freedom. Freedom in Christ. Freedom forever. Help us, oh God, we pray through Jesus. God's people said.